ends of this whole concept of war and terror. And uh, I think we, in both our narratives should be moving away from that. But of course, regional the problem of militancy, problems of regional militancy, extremism remain. Some of this militancy and extremism would be probably on a domestic framework within countries, but a lot of this extremism is also cross-border. And, uh, and that where it is linked with geopolitics of borders. Your whole uh, uh, you know, uh, presentation didn't really speak about the peculiar geopolitics of border which leads to these transborder militancy. And we focused in your presentation when you talked about militancy, talked about transborder movements and non-state actors, you, you kind of just focused on the Kashmir border. And But for you, as India, we all are aware, you are aware, you're dealing with a full number of militant organizations which are internal to India. And some of this transborder militancy you're facing even on the Nepalese border. So, and I think there is a whole number of other flashpoints in the region, like in Central Asia, Fargana Valley is a, a flashpoint. And for Pakistan, I think this during line, the, the Pakistan border is another flashpoint. So I think we have to move away from that and start looking at how the geopolitics of border itself kind of give rise to these movements. Thank you. Just, um, my name is Rukhana Siddiqui and I'm a professor of international relations at Fayyaz University. Um, Dr. Dweek has talked about um, similarities or differences amongst the two nations. Um, we can go on endlessly. If a nation is hermetically sealed from its neighbors, Obviously, there will be a Roshomonic difference in paradigms. So we can go on all night to think of it. Aisha Bilal once said that you have to be extremely creative to solve the problem of India and Pakistan, to solve the problem of Kashmir. You have to use your brains. I am not in the business of doing South Asia study. My stuff is, I do sub saharan America. I did it deliberately. I stayed away from the speed with the right to <laughs> and it gets you right <laughs> Doctor, there is one elephant in the room that is being ignored continuously. And that elephant, sir, is that this is a very patriarchal discourse. Your discourse is patriarchal, our discourse is patriarchal, and the 50% majority in this room or in this country or yours or ours is being you know, Madiba, Nelson Mandela Saab, when I was in Johannesburg teaching at Wits, there was a big halabaloo going about kosher and non kosher food in South Africa. Halal and non halal kosher. Madiba created a wonderful solution. He said, Sara gosh, zabi halabaloo. Because people who eat, who are non Muslims in South Africa, were willing to eat kosher food, halal food, and the problem was solved like this. Brilliant people, rocket scientists, PhDs, people sitting here are unable to come at a conclusion. I have a little solution I may offer because everybody is talking about problems. What have the women of Pakistan done to deserve not getting visas to go to India? Tell your government to just abolish visas for the women of the both countries. <laughs> Of us being India 
I don't understand why you know this goes, uh, constantly goes on. Every time we just constantly hear that the Pakistan military is India for big, we as a nation are India for big. We are not. You force us to be. Thank you, and maybe I want to thank everybody for these very stimulating questions and comments. I'll try and be brief because I know that I'm standing between everyone and lunch, but it really has been a very worthwhile, very worthwhile exchange. Um, obviously, echo Malia said the point that we have to be bigger than the things that divide us, and I just want to applaud that. As you know, said, Durani, good to see you again. Yes, I spoke here five years ago on, on, on UN issues. Today we have a different uh, set of issues to deal with. Um, I must say that people are conscious very much of the return of the helicopter. And don't forget that the green light to attend this Istanbul meeting came after the previous red light the previous year. So it, it, there was a fair amount of, uh, of hard work uh, which, um, which had accompanied, in fact, the visit to India of President uh, Gul uh, when Pakistan had prevented Turkey from inviting India to the earlier Istanbul meeting. So there had been some, uh, shall we say, wrong to be undone. But having said that, these are all very, very positive things. At the same time, on Afghanistan there is a, a certain difference of perception between Pakistan and India, and I don't think it's right to say it's purely because of India's regard for US concerns. Uh, I think it's uh, to do with the fact that we are genuinely concerned that the present Afghan establishment, the government and the army, is not in a position to sustain itself without external assistance for somewhat longer. You know, we have no military presence or objectives in Afghanistan, but we've spent the largest uh, foreign aid program in India is in Afghanistan. We spent $1.5 billion, and we've got $500 million more on the pipeline. And what have we spent it on? Clinics, uh, the maternal and child health hospital, a revival of girls' schools, the construction of an electricity cable 3,000 meters high from Kabul to Kulitaki, which is actually giving you 24 7 electricity in Kabul for the first time since 82. Uh, you've got the, the Zaradara Highway in southwestern Afghanistan opening up trade route to Iran. You've got the construction of the Afghan parliament, and this is the sort of stuff. And all of these kinds of activities would frankly be unsustainable without a security environment. We believe that at the moment the US is prepared to, uh, or NATO so far is prepared to maintain. So clearly we look at the prospects of a post withdrawal Afghanistan somewhat differently uh, from uh, Pakistan, but I don't believe these are areas we can't talk about. I think we can. And I think that there should be more dialogue, both uh, in public forums like Istanbul and frankly in behind closed doors, uh, as I hope is taking place, uh, as, as Nassim Zanayev has already implied. Um, on your question about Salada Tech Post, I only didn't mention Salada Tech Post because it has nothing to do with India or with India Pakistan. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you were talking about human beings and terrorism and uh, human rights. No, no, quite a lot. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's anybody in India who. It's happy to see human beings uh, in Pakistan being killed, especially in this case, apparently, in, in, in an act that, that seems to be accident. But, uh, but I don't know, but I, it, it just wasn't something that came into my frame of reference. On Kashmir, frankly, my wife is Kashmiri, and I, I have a very strong, uh, uh, shall we say, domestic constituency <laughs> on the Kashmir issue. Uh, and from, from both sides of it, both from the, uh, somebody who has, is actually from the valley, not as has been wrongly reported in some places, from anywhere else, but from the valley itself, uh, from the village in the valley, grown up with, with this strong sense of this Kashmiri, but who has since been expelled by terrorists and uh, who burned down her home and so on. She has a complicated set of views, and I hope that if you're going to stay for lunch and have a word with her uh, on, 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 on Kashmir, because the truth is that uh, there are narratives there too on both sides of the issue. I don't think there is anybody with my sort of background and orientation who would condone any human rights violations. But as an Indian MP, my focus is on sustaining a system where any wrongs that may be done are immediately brought to light within our system, exposed and dealt with within. We have democratic elections in Kashmir, we have a freely elected uh, uh, establishment in Kashmir, the chief minister uh, is, is the one who makes the decisions, we are very, very anxious to ensure that the military does not, either accidentally or deliberately, uh, conduct itself in a manner that does dis discredit to Indian democracy, and these are the things we stand for in India, and as an MPI I certainly uh, would, would, if there was any proof of, a, of, 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 of wrongdoing or abuse, I would be happy to speak against it. But at the same time, the narrative in Kashmir is a, is a little more complicated than just one-sided. And I, I want to come back to um, the, the point made about the plebiscite by the gentleman of the front row, 
uh, which was actually an exchange of letters in 52, at a time when Sheikh Abdullah was actually flirting with the notion of an independent Kashmir rather than a Nebisat. Uh, so what tactical motives lay behind Nehru's uh, position? But, I mean, I don't know, no one will know because you can only read the text of the letter and not the thinking that lay behind it. Uh, however, back in 48, the two were on the same page. And developments between 48 and 52, including this, this frankly, Western encouraged notion of an independent Kashmir may have changed the calculations. But it's also from Srinagar, can I add a point of view? Yes, sir. Sheikh Abdullah's influence, which is so much exaggerated in the Indo Pakistani narrative, was strictly limited inside the Kashmir Valley. When you add together the areas that constitute Muzaffarabad, Poonch, and all other areas, Sheikh Abdullah was a small Vein diagram in a larger vein diagram of the general Kashmir state. No, you're quite right. You're quite right in that. You but in fact, that. Since, uh, since like your wife, I'm also from Srinagar. My family lives over there. She's a novice in the Kashmir so far. It's not like the Punjabi and Pashtun in Pakistan who doesn't understand the Kashmir history. I am a son of no, no, I understand. I know in fact, one can go further. There is actually a demographic difference between the parts that you call Azad Kashmir and the valley, uh, including language. I mean, whatever we uh, call Kashmir is hardly spoken in, in Azad Kashmir, it's mainly Punjabi, whereas in the valley. State, but the state was Jammu and Kashmir. The state was Jammu and Kashmir. The state was not Kashmir is speaking. No, I think there is a, a sense of uh, political affiliation that is also linked to language, ethnicity, manner of faith, and so on. So in the narrative is complicated. But it's just not. I, I, I want to repeat what I said to the gentleman in the back there. If India were really doing what you suggest India is doing, I would certainly concede that there is a certain level of moral equivalence. I simply don't believe it. And I, I, you know, as, as I say, I'm not some sort of innocent person from the streets who read newspapers only. I have some access to, to people who make decisions on these matters. I have some access to information and to meetings. And I have absolutely no reason to believe that India is doing anything remotely like that. Uh, and this is where clearly, this is where clearly is an area of mistrust. But you and I are not going to settle this because neither am I doing it nor are you doing it. Denial. All we know is we have mutual uh, concerns. That, that denial is a moral equivalent of us denying that Kassab was in a Pakistani. Well, if you can provide uh, <laughs> all the proof that Kassab is provided for being a Pakistani, <laughs> by finding some Indian who's done uh, havoc in Baluchistan, I'll listen to you. Um, on the point about the geopolitics of the border, uh, which I think is a very interesting and, and a sort of intellectual uh, exercise, uh, the number of things that can be said it would, would make for a, uh, an academic discussion. I can be provocative and say that Mumbai doesn't short, share a border with Pakistan, but the geopolitics went beyond the border and intruded into Mumbai. But I know what you're getting at. I think you're quite right. These issues are complex. My, my brief was to talk on India-Pakistan. It was not, by the way, the topic that I first suggested. I thought I would have a much more uh, happy time here talking about something that didn't involve India and Pakistan. But this was what the Jinnah Institute wanted to hear about and I decided to, to honor their wish. But for example, if you look at violence in India, we have serious problems with nationalized violence that has nothing to do with Pakistan or any other country. I mean, it is, it is to do with uh, large numbers of unemployed young men, uh, mainly of tribal origin, our Aboriginal peoples in our Pakistan areas, who feel they have nothing to lose by picking up the gun. And we need to deal with that including through giving them incentives to flourish within a thriving Indian state rather than taking up the weapons against it. So there are all kinds of violence taking place that I agree go well beyond this particular narrative, but that wasn't my topic. My to topic was not about irregular violence. So it was specifically about India-Pakistan, and I identified tremendous potential for cooperation and one major obstacle, which we see, which is the obstacle of, 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 of terrorism. I want to applaud the question about patriarchal discourse. The, with some immodesty, I will point out that I mentioned my wife at least three times. I wasn't totally patriarchal. She gives me very, very uh, solid anchoring on these issues, and she's often sent to me this message about heart, which is something that I believe we do need to think about too, 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 very, too, too often. Uh, discussions about relations between countries get mired in strategic issues, military talk, political talk, uh, foreign policy talk. But there are human beings on both sides of the border, and that heart that she wants me to, to grow, she doesn't feel I've entirely grown one yet, uh, is one that, that I was not absent from my talk. But I love your idea of abolishing these guys for women. And I think I'd be mischievous. It would be a great start. I think I would be mischievous enough to suggest it back in India if the media doesn't already reveal my support. <laughs> I, think, I think we should have. Uh, we should have, we should, we should certainly liberalize the visa regime, and in my view that's a strong, strong preference of mine. I even got into trouble as a minister for saying that, so I'm very willing to say it as, a, as, a, as an ordinary MP. Uh, 
about uh, definitely women's groups and, 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 and women's activities on both sides of the border, both for peace but also for simply things to improve the lives of women in, in, in their own societies and therefore to share experiences that are relevant to other communities would be wonderful. And I think that um, as my, my wife has been active in some women's empowerment issues in India, I suspect there are very similar problems in, in, in Pakistan. I think women talking to each other would be a terrific way forward. And we should have a, a specific track to dialogue that excludes all those of the underprivileged gender that uh, the three of us here represent. Uh, and finally, to the last question about why are the forces positioned the way they are, I can only point to 48, 65, 71, 99, Cargill. I mean, uh, as I said, trust has to be built. Uh, I don't think, I mean, there is a major difference in the role of the military in our society. I mean, we've actually had a situation as an op-ed writer has pointed out in today's dawn, where the chief of our general staff has essentially been told that he has to retire, not on the date of birth that he legitimately believes to be the correct date of birth, but the date of birth wrongly entered in the military records, that he would have to go a year earlier than required, because that's, that's the way things work. The military does not get to, to determine uh, things like how long it serves. Uh, in these positions and so we, we have a very different military. So the military uh, would be very happy to follow instructions from the civilian government to move away, to redeploy, whatever. That is our system. But it frankly would only happen when we are totally satisfied and convinced that there is no belligerence possible from your side. So you see, as I, I said, as I, I said, what you're trying to say is that there is a fear in, in Indian heart that there will be an adventure from our side. Is that what you're trying to say? There is still because, you know, Pakistan does want to change the status quo. I mean, whether you call it diplomatic support, diplomatic support for the Kashmiri militancy or whatever, there is only one partner in this dialogue that wants to redraw uh, the present day reality. The other one is a status quo partner. So that's why India's position cannot be seen as, as, as aggressive. If Pakistan said, we settle this issue on these terms, it's over, we withdraw X number of divisions from the border, India would be happy to do so. And frankly, all you need to do is meet two Indian and pa Pakistani Punjabis together to know how much, how little that border matters between them at various levels. They really have so much more in common they'd like to flourish with. And those of us who are not Punjabi can only marvel at, the, at, at, at seeing uh, an Indian and a Pakistani Punjabi meeting. There is an issue that needs to be settled. I accept that. Once terms have been agreed by both sides, I don't think we'll find any worry about the problem because India genuinely has no aggressive intent whatsoever towards Pakistan. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Shashita for your time. The way that we have been situated, let me explain. I'd like to thank on behalf of the Nancy Thank you for the very provocative talk, which you can protest generated a very good discussion. And uh, to be very honest with you, I personally, myself, have been to go to say a few things, but because everybody is hungry and everybody wants to read, I'm going to restrict my remarks to just thanking you. And just adding this that we need to move forward, we need to go ahead, and there the police political personalities like you can play a very important role. What is required between the two countries, apart from nitpicking about these different issues that we tackle every day, is a leap of faith which, can, which we can overcome the previous suspicions and we can move forward, we can take the narrative from a totally different way than what we have been going through up till now. And with these few words, I thank you again and please uh, let's go for lunch. Gracias.